Steve. Can you hear me okay? Is that right? Good? All right. Thank you, Steve. If you haven't met Steve Little, he's one of the nicest people you'll ever meet in the world, so fantastic. All right. I'm going to talk to you today about evidence-based entrepreneurship, okay? and uh, share some information. So first of all, let's see if I can get some street cred with you. Steve shared a little bit about my experience, so I'll just summarize it a little bit with this slide here. So part of my experience is that I left BYU in 85 as a student, went back to my hometown of Seattle, and I got involved in the Yellow Pages industry, which was an interesting time. In 1984, the federal government broke up the largest company in the world at the time, AT&T, American Telephone and Telegraph, that had, was the company started by Alexander Graham Bell when he invented the telephone. And the government in 1933 gave that company a monopoly on phone service in most of the United States. And so it had become very big and large, but too powerful. So the federal government broke it up into eight different companies in 1984, which was very good timing for me leaving school to start up a competing company against one of its elements, which is the Yellow Pages, because it was unregulated and very lucrative. So started doing print yellow pages in the Seattle area, and over a number of years, it grew rapidly and expanded to Portland, Oregon, and got big and competed against the, one of the companies that broke off from AT&T called US West, which also covered Utah. And then in 94, a guy in a black, all black outfit walked into my office and said, I need to show you something. He's a hipster, back in 94, a hipster. And he showed me this thing called the internet. And I thought, well, isn't that for academics and like the government? And he said, no, 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 an attorney just uh, used email to get new clients, and so now people are using it for advertising. I go, really? Interesting. And so uh, I said, hmm, tell me about more about this. And I started envisioning a day when I said, if this thing goes and people are walking around with a high-speed, always-on portable device, Yellow Pages could be threatened. So I thought about that and decided to start an Internet Yellow Pages company. And so in January 95, I launched Banana Pages Online. My company was called Banana Pages. And uh, that's a funny name for Seattle, gray, rainy Seattle to have a banana name. But I kind of revolutionized the industry, changing the word yellow to a, a name. And so everybody else, all the big companies did too. Like, so, Southern Bell became Real Pages, Southwestern Bell became Smart Pages, GTE became Super Pages. Everybody caught on to that. I was the first guy to do that. And then I started Banana Pages Online, and I said, you know what, instead of just my company going through this portal, why not get all the publishing companies to go through my portal? So I signed up 40 other publishers to join me and formed Yellow Pages on the Internet. And then I had 10 big companies want to buy that one of them being Microsoft in my backyard up in Seattle. And so I spent about nine months talking to Microsoft. And then three guys left Microsoft and convinced me not to sell it to Microsoft, to merge it in with their effort. And so we four started InfoSpace. And two years later, about two and a half years later, we were public on the NASDAQ um, with about 1,500 employees. So it was a real rocket ship ride. And then I started speaking at BYU. And they liked how I spoke and invited me to come teach here. Not a PhD, so it can happen. Uh, the company still exists. It's called Blue Cora. So InfoSpace was it, and it still exists today. It's always been a company with no debt and lots of revenue and has always done pretty well. Now, after you do something like that, you become usually, as a successful entrepreneur, you start becoming what we call an angel investor and investing in other entrepreneurs because you don't want to ever work that hard again. You want to make money from other people working hard. And so I've done a lot of investments. Um, my best of all time is Omniture. I flew down from Seattle to Provo and met with Josh, James, and John Pastana on Center Street here in Provo. They were in a dingy second floor office, really depressing, dark colored walls and kind of beat up office. And I gave them a check. And that was a very smart thing to do. They almost died 10 times in the next four years. But somehow in the fifth year, they figured everything out. And they went through the roof. And of course, now we have Adobe. They sold for $2 billion to Adobe. And Adobe just announced they're going to do another building with another 1,000 employees here in Utah, which is exciting. And so that's all coming from two students that met in this building in Lynn McKell's information systems class. And 
there's absolutely no reason Two of you in this class couldn't do the exact same thing. I've seen it many times. So lots of investing. I've done over 80 plus uh, direct investments in other entrepreneurs, hundreds of others through being in a venture fund. Now, I've also started teaching entrepreneurship. And so spent 12 years at BYU, about a little less than a year at UVU. And then I've started my own boot camp, which I'll talk more about a little bit. And then I've done some of these other things helping the ecosystem. And that's me. Um, this are some of the companies I'm currently investing in. I have about 25 current investments. Some of these are BYU student founded businesses. Um, mm -hmm. And they're going really well, most of them. And I'm excited for them. And so uh, some of them are super early stage. Some of them are multi-million dollars already. And uh, like this one this is a multi-million dollar company started by two BYU students that walked into the fourth floor here and met me and they were really messed up, didn't know what they were doing. They started meeting with all of us and they started figuring things out. Through 11 pivots later, they hit on a great business model and there we're going. So with that, this is what's really important in life. This is my family, I'm just like you with problems, family challenges. There's nothing different about you from me or from Josh James, John Pastana or the founders of Four Up, or any of these students. The last class I taught here was the third time a student took my class. He still hasn't graduated from BYU, but he started a company and sold it for $54 million to Snapchat. So right here in this building, the Tanner Building. Amazing place, isn't it, Steve? So now these people, my kids, they're kind of important, but these are the most important people now. Just make sure that's clear. That's why they're in the foreground. They're the power people. They run our lives, OK. So there we are with them. And I had to show this one. This is one of my new ones. Oh, my goodness. Now, is she cute or what? Come on now, guys. OK. All right. So with that, I want to talk to you about the scientific method. And Steve Little doesn't get to answer this because he is a geek. So do you remember in sixth grade biology class, the scientific method? Who can tell me what it is? Anybody? Yeah, what is it? Okay, before you form a hypothesis, what do you have to do? Usually observe some sort of uh, correlation. So you're you gonna have to have a question or a problem, right? Question or a problem, and then you do a little background research and then form a hypothesis, right? So you had pretty good, right? Everybody get that process? It's a really important process to the history of the world. And so the scientific method is described in some places like this. A body of techniques for investigating phenomena, things that happen, acquiring new knowledge, or correcting and integrating previous knowledge. So the scientific method, actually we can find out new things that replace our assumptions and what we thought was true before. That's an interesting thing. And so what the heck does this have to do with entrepreneurship and business? You're gonna find out it has everything to do with entrepreneurship and business. Now, another description is a method of procedure that has characterized natural science since the 17th century consisting in systematic observation, measurement, and experiment, and the formulation, testing, and modification of hypotheses. Kind of what was said here. So with that, scientific method looks like this, these steps. Again, you have to have a purpose or a question. You do some background research. You form a hypothesis, you design an experiment, conduct the experiment, and then do data analysis on the experiment, and draw a conclusion whether or not your hypothesis was correct, and how that starts to help you formulate an answer to your question or problem. Is this process important in the academic world, Steve? Very important. Very important. So with that, we don't like to show it, at least I don't, in just a serial like that. It's actually a loop. So when you do this and you go through this, it's a loop that you follow through. And then you have a sub-loop here of refining, altering, expanding, or rejecting hypotheses until you get to answers. Now, this is important. Stick with me here for a minute. Now, with that said, I want to introduce also the concept of evidence and the importance of evidence. No matter how much we try, we can't wish things to be true that simply aren't. 
And that's a problem. And so you can't wish things to be true. As entrepreneurs, we have to be very careful of falling into the trap of assuming that we're a special snowflake and that things that we think are true are true just because we think they're true. That can be very costly. One of my goals here today is if you ever pursue entrepreneurship is that you minimize the spend of time and money. And time is actually the most valuable commodity you've been given. More than money. There's unending amounts of money available in this world for lots of different things. But time, your man or person hours, to be politically correct, your hours cannot be manufactured. You can't get them back. Once an hour ticks by, it's gone, and you're only going to live a certain amount of hours. So what you do with that time ends up being the, probably the most important decision you'll ever make, day in, day out. Are you going to sit on a couch and play six hours of Xbox games? Maybe one time that would be fun. Are you going to do it every day for the next two years? You might not get married at BYU if you do that. So, the importance of evidence. Now, what is evidence? Evidence is anything used to determine or demonstrate the truth of an assertion. Scientific evidence is evidence which serves to either support or counter a scientific theory or a hypothesis. In scientific research, evidence is accumulated through observations of phenomena occurring naturally or created as experiments. So, you get the scientific method and the importance of evidence in doing this. So let's take a look a little bit at something. I want to show you an example from criminal forensics on how important evidence is. This is really important and I want to drill it into your head because it's just as important in entrepreneurship. But in for criminal forensics we're making life or death decisions based on evidence and if we have no evidence and make a decision or fault the evidence and make a decision it can really cause problems. And it can do that also in an entrepreneurial venture. Now, I'm going to do a little attention test. So there's going to be some guys shooting basketballs. And your job is to count the number of times a basket shot has been attempted. Are you ready to watch a quick video and do that? OK. Get out of your way. Should be going. Hopefully it's going. Let's see. Maybe I'm too far away to click it in. And hopefully the sound's going. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, there it goes. Hopefully he switched the sound over on me. How many got 20? Watch this. So, how many got 20? How many noticed the person switching out on the shooting? How many noticed the volleyball being shot? Okay. So, humans, some see that, some don't. And so it's interesting, eyewitness testimony can be a problem in criminal forensics. So let's take a look at this. This is something that, again, we'll have a point in just a second. I want you to hear this story. This uh, woman was raped when she was in college. And here's the story of what happened. I was 
So what happened here, I'm going to show one more in a second, Steve. What happened here is this woman was raped, and she actually studied the face of her attacker if she lived so she could really identify him later. And they caught somebody on a tip. And she testified that this one man was it. Twelve years later, after he'd been in prison, sentenced for his whole life to be in prison, DNA testing proved that she was wrong very, very costly to society, very costly to that man. Very interesting story. Here's a little bit more about how it happened. Detective Mike Baldwin met Jennifer at the hospital. The first time I remember her making was that, I'm going to get this guy to do this to me. She said, I took the time to look at him. I will be able to identify him if I'm being on my Detective Baldwin worked with Jennifer to make a composite sketch, going over eyes, noses, ears, lips, trying to recreate the face she had seen that night. The sketch went out, and tips started coming in. One of those tips was about a young man named Ronald Cotton, who worked at a restaurant near the scene of both rapes and had a record, a guilty plea to breaking and entering, and as a teenager, to sexual assault. Three days after the rape, Mike Walden called Jennifer in to do a photo lineup. He laid these six pictures down on the table, said the perpetrator may or may not be one of them, and told her to take her time. Does she say immediately that's him? No, she studied each photograph. I can remember almost feeling like I was in an SAT test. You know, we start narrowing down the choices. You can discount A and B and oh, like multiple choice. choice. Exactly. According to the police report, Jennifer studied the pictures for five minutes. She picked up Ron's photograph and said, that's the matter right now. And he must have said, are you sure? And she said, yes. Oh, oh yes, certainly. Ronald Cotton heard the news from his mother's boyfriend. He told me, he said, Ron, he said, I always love for you. And I said, for what? And he told me, for rape, I snapped. And they said, fine, I like that. Did you panic? I didn't panic. I'm trying to figure out, you know, why. He comes in and gives me a very detailed uh, account of where he was, who he was with that night. As it turns out, uh, that was a false alibi. I realized later that I got my weekends confused, and so therefore, I gave them the reason to think that I was lying. This was August 1st, 1984. Right. You go in to clear yourself. When did you actually leave? I didn't. He was locked up, and days later, put in a physical line. I'm number five. You scared? I was nervous, and nervous, I was so nervous, I was trembling, that I felt my body just shaking. They were asked to step forward, speak, and step back. I can remember looking to the detective and saying, it's the 24 and 5, and I have to do it again. And then she knew it was number 5, Ronald Cott. Did you feel absolutely certain? Absolutely certain. Did anybody say any good job? What was said to me afterwards was, that's the same person picked out the photo lineup. So in my mind, I thought, bingo, I did it right. I did it right. What happened was, she made a mistake based on her feelings. Now, this is important because what does this have to do with entrepreneurship? When you launch a company, you're going to make decisions daily, weekly, monthly, that will affect many things. Most of all, it'll affect the use of that precious commodity time 
and money. And it's important to understand that maybe entrepreneurship, like forensics, is not a guessing or wishing game. It's a science, an evidence-based science. And that's fascinating to come to realize. So the punchline for today, and by the way, just to finish the story, these two, she met him at the prison when he walked out and was the DNA exonerated him, hugged him and said she was sorry, and he goes instantly, I forgive you. They've been best friends ever since and have spent the last decade going around the country helping other prisoners get out based on DNA, and there's been hundreds that have gotten out, even people on death row that were truly not guilty. Think about it. So with this, the punchline for today is this. Entrepreneurship is a science that requires the scientific method. It's not a whimsical activity. It's actually a scientific process. Evidence-based entrepreneurship. That's why I called this talk that. Now, you can't wish something to make it true. Just like a witness who says that something is true, but the real evidence shows something else, others Entrepreneurs make huge decisions that can have big consequences doing the exact same thing. Hopefully, when you get engaged here at BYU and its entrepreneurship program, if you go down that route in any way and work with the Entrepreneurship Center, entrepreneurship classes, you're getting trained to be an entrepreneurial scientist. Now, at my boot camp, Startup Ignition, which is here in Provo, that's what we do too. We do this. So, after leaving BYU to go to Google and finishing up at Google and spending about a semester or two at UVU, I decided to start my own little mini university for entrepreneurship so that people not at a university could take it. So, you know, people that were 30 and didn't want to go back to college could take this type of information. And it's been going well. I've been doing it for about two years. So let's do something. Let's teach you a little bit about how science and entrepreneurship fused. How did they come to fuse and be one? and come together. So we need a little history. We're going to review the history. The history is this. In the 20th century, the 1900s, this man right here was the head of the largest and most powerful corporation in the first half of the century in terms of manufacturing, and that was General Motors, and his name was Alfred Sloan. Alfred Sloan was leading General Motors and managing that company in a certain way that became known as the Sloan management style. He became such a successful manager that the universities around the nation adopted his style of management for practice and theory and teaching. And it's really fascinating to see what happened. And some of you may be exposed to this story, but it's just still fascinating to review. Now, the MIT School of Business is named the Sloan School of Business, named after him at MIT. Now, the funny thing is, is that Sloan is not the founder of General Motors, not even close. He was a hired gun manager. The real founder of General Motors has a quite different story. He was a maverick individual, very different from a corporate manager the kind of training you would get in an MBA program. So who is he? His name was Billy Durant. Billy Durant was a horse and buggy guy in the 1890s and actually didn't like cars when he first saw them. When Henry Ford started Ford Motor Company, he wasn't so sure cars were going to be the thing because he liked the horse and buggy industry. He was making new models every year, changing the design, selling horse, uh, horse buggies. And then he said, OK, maybe this car thing's here to stay. So he started up General Motors to compete against Ford. And he was very successful. Became a very big and large, powerful company. And then, as it became a mature corporation, the board of directors said, this guy's a little too crazy. So they fired him from his own company. This happens quite a bit. By the way, in your lifetime, has that happened to somebody? Steve Jobs, did it happen to him? So the story is very similar, actually, because what Billy Durant did is he went and started a new company called Chevrolet. He started this company, Chevrolet, and then got the DuPont family, the wealthiest family in America, 
in the 1920s. Matter of fact, the DuPont family is interesting. They arrived penniless from Holland on January 1st of 1800. And a hundred years later, they were the wealthiest family in America. They had not a penny in their pocket when they landed on it in New York. Fascinating story of self. But he went and talked to DuPonts into funding him after he started Chevrolet, and that became successful. And they funded him buying back General Motors. So they bought General Motors, and Billy Durant merged Chevrolet and General Motors together, and that's how Chevrolet became part of General Motors, which it still is to today in 2017. So it's a fascinating story. He's a real maverick. His style of management was very different from corporate management. So what happened, though, is he came back, and the company grew to be wildly big and successful again, and the board of directors said, he's too crazy again, and they fired him a second time. Now, he still had a lot of money, because when you get fired, you don't lose your stock in the company. So he was very wealthy, and there's a big story to the finish of his life. I won't bore you with the details here, but a real maverick entrepreneur. That's when they hired Alfred Sloan to take the company and management, manage it in a more corporate way, and the rest is history. Now, this is an important story, because in the 1900s, the theory and practice around teaching entrepreneurship and then practicing entrepreneurship after being taught it started adopting this corporate mentality from Sloan, but it didn't teach that in a newer venture, you have to have a more maverick style of entrepreneurship. And so what happened was, over time, they decided that entrepreneurship was going to basically just be a miniaturized version of a corporation, so the theory and practice around entrepreneurship would just be reduction in size. So we're going to take supply chain, marketing, finance, organizational behavior, all these disciplines you'd see as majors in this business school, we're just going to take all those and we're going to miniaturize them for an entrepreneurial venture and that'll work. So a startup is just a small corporation. So that came up and it turned into where we have these things going on where, oh, okay, at a corporation when we want to start a new product, we have to plan the business and write up a case for it, write up a 30-page business plan and say, here's what we're going to do, we think. Entrepreneur processes, we got to develop the product and see if we can make it before we do anything. Entrepreneurship focus, oh, we first thought, okay, where are we going to get the money? Well, in a corporation, you think, okay, I got to get a budget before I can start this project. Got to get a budget. So as an entrepreneur, I better go raise money, right? So we started doing this. Entrepreneurship team, heavily divisionized roles. And so we started teaching, that's how you do it. The problem with this is that that resulted in massive failure rate. The results were very poor success. 90% of entrepreneurial ventures in the last 100 years have failed after spending lots of time and money at them. Business planning, writing up a business plan in advance of doing anything else, has, show, has shown to be of little effect in the outcome of a startup. And also, the training that you get based on that corporate practice and theory doesn't lead to any success either. So there was a problem. Now, people started saying, okay, well, these studies are showing this, so what's the answer? Well, you must be born an entrepreneur. You're just born one. You either won or you're not. That must be why that 10% are successful. We don't know how to train them. We don't know how to teach them. They're just born that way. They're high energy or run their head through brick walls. But lots of studies were done on that, and that also did not prove to be true. So that was a problem. Then it was concluded that, hmm, maybe, maybe a startup is not a miniature corporation, and we've had the wrong process and theory all along. Well, Steve and I were teaching here at BYU, and in the year 2007, we kind of noticed what was going on. We didn't get it until a couple years later. But in 2007, a big thing was happening in the entrepreneurial world. There was a fellow that had made $500 million, and he went to Berkeley and Stanford to be an adjunct professor, and he arrived and taught his first semester class. And here's how you do a startup and he found out what everybody was teaching at Stanford and Berkeley, and he condemned them all. 
and said they were teaching wrong. That went over really well with the PhDs, by the way. Oh, yeah. He's a non-PhD coming in at Stanford, Berkeley, saying, uh, you're teaching wrong. That's interesting. So went ahead, and the fellows, the, this page right here is listed of the leaders in this new thinking. In 2007, Steve Blank introduced the concept of the lean startup. The Lean Startup has revolutionized entrepreneurship. It's now about a decade old. And these are the leaders in thought around it. This fellow, Eric Reese, who wrote the book called The Lean Startup, took that first class from Steve Blank at Berkeley and then wrote this book and became a New York Times bestseller. The first book written was this one, The Four Steps of the Epiphany by Steve Blank, but it was very poorly written, but it had great content. He then wrote a book called The um, uh, not the Four Steps of the Epiphany, I've got to get a different graphic, that's wrong. It was called the Startup Owner's Manual. And the Startup Owner's Manual, which I'll show on this page right here, is a masterpiece of how to do a startup. If you read this book, it's the equivalent of sitting down with me for like 10 hours and getting tips. So. This is a really good book. This one's also legendary by Alex Osterwalder. He created a tool to help you do uh, Lean Startup. And then I like Ash Mora, who I believe Center for Entrepreneurship is bringing out this academic year to Utah. Is that correct? Uh, he's going to be part of the IBM suit. Yeah. International business model. Yeah, and he's coming out here. He'll be here. So don't miss that. His books, Running Lean and Scaling Lean, are awesome too. So these are the thought leaders in this. So I don't want you to think what I'm sharing with you today is my thinking. I'm just a teacher of it and help people do it. So here's what's going on. It's been discovered that the old model was a planning-based model where we plan, build, and launched, and plan, build, launch. The new entrepreneurial model that has been introduced is a learning-based model where we identify our key assumptions, validate those assumptions, iterate to the right product, but I want to keep it simple. Entrepreneurship is a science. All that Steve Blank has done, and these leaders and thought leaders, is that they have said, take the scientific method and apply it to a startup. It's as simple as it is. That's what's going on here. It has profound implications, and it's changed the success rate. So when we look at this, the Lean Startup brings a scientific method to entrepreneurship, and the Lean Startup is basically evidence-based entrepreneurship. What does this mean? When we retrofit the scientific method to, to entrepreneurship, we look at it and say, oh, we have an idea. Okay, let's form a hypothesis of what the business model for bringing that idea to market would be. Let's run experiments to see if our assumptions of that business model are correct. If they're correct, we persevere and they prove our hypothesis. If they don't, we pivot and go back and iterate the process, just like if you were asking the question, why does this plant grow three feet? Not four feet, not five feet, not two feet, but three feet. What happens? We can run a scientific experiment to find out why that happens. That's what science is about. Well, the good news in calling entrepreneurship a science is that means all of you can do it. You don't have to be born in a certain family. You don't have to be born with a certain skill set. You don't have to be born with some trait. There's no correlation in all the research of traits among entrepreneurs other than a few key ones, and some are surprising. But they don't say, oh, this group is going to be more successful than others. Absolutely. There's no research showing that. So, you will take a process and apply it. Now, when we talk about this, I want to boil it down really simply for you. This is the classic product development model that Procter & Gamble would teach you on how to bring a product to market. We have a seed of an idea, a concept, we develop the product, we alpha beta test it, and then we launch it to our customers. Now, you can do that because you have four other products and the marketing data coming in from them tell you you need a fifth product, so we're going to add a new product now. It's known problem, so we're going to manage it in this fashion. That doesn't work for a startup, because a startup is guessing from the very start what the problem is and who the customer is, and it's a guess, a hypothesis, and we have to go prove it. 
So if we apply this, pro oh, I'm missing some, interesting, I don't like when it does that. This is not good. I'll fill in the boxes myself. If we apply this process to entrepreneurship, it is come up with an idea, talk to your mom, and she tells you how great it is, get some money, rent an office, start hiring people, then launch it with the customer. That's what the rest, most of the world does in entrepreneurship. Not sure why my text isn't coming through there. What we're saying now is take the customer, put them at the beginning. This is the new model for entrepreneurship. This is the lean startup in a nutshell. We go in and discover who the customer is and what problem they have and if it's monetizable and then what model, what business model we can wrap around that idea and make value in the marketplace. And if we figure those things out, then we start creating customers, signing them up, taking their money and start building a company. The problem that a lot of you will do if you don't get trained while you're here at BYU on how to do Lean Startup is you're going to start a company and you're going to jump right to this phase in here and think you're a real company and you're going to commit the sin called premature scaling. What we want to do first is discover demand and then have ongoing discovery. Here's a quick little video about this and how to think about it. This is the story of that. come to me and say, hey, John, I want you to invest in my deal. Do you know what my first question is going to be? What do you think it is? Have you validated it? Validated what, though? Not just the idea, the full business model. I ask you for a copy of your business model represented in a one-page representation, which is what Alex Osterwalder has one of the authors I had up there design called the business model canvas. And then I say, okay, this is your representation of your business model, how you're going to create, capture, and deliver value in the marketplace. How have you gone out and proven that it will work? And a lot of you are going to say, well, that's why I need your money so I can go build a product and get it out there to see if it works. It's not how you do it. Don't do it that way. You take a very inexpensive prototype, maybe even a pencil drawing on a piece of paper, and take it to the customers and find out what they think. There's my time. So this is an important process, and it's revolutionized my life as an entrepreneur. It's revolutionized my life as an investor and as an educator. I want you to hear a quick quote from Steve Blank about this. Now, no, is there a 
startup isn't a smaller version of large company. It took us decades to get down to a simple definition. A startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Now, these couple of sentences are fraught with me. A startup is a temporary organization. What does that mean? What does that mean? This is such a profound statement. A startup is a temporary organization. The product of your company when you start it, because it's not really a company, is the product of a startup, which is not your widget that you're trying to make. It's actually the business model. You're going to take the work as a startup that you do in figuring out a business model and then go through a transition and become a company. If you start on day one and act like you're a company, you will lose time and money. And it will be very costly. This happens all over the world. Now, it's much like the caterpillar and the butterfly. The startup can be thought of as the caterpillar and then goes through metamorphosis to become a beautiful butterfly. It's very similar. Now, focusing on the startup here, here's what I'm saying. If I were to start on a timeline, say, okay, I'm starting my venture my startup, and I think I'm right, my business model is right, I'm going to go get money from whoever and I'm going to start spending money building the company, it's going to be six months or a year before you finally find out that you were wrong. And then you're going to make some changes and then if you're not doing things right, it'll take another six months or a year to go through two iterations of finding out you're wrong. But we don't want to do that. What Lean Startup is telling you to do is this. Instead of going through what I just explained and making it a long process and doing this, we want to do this. We want to fail many rapid times quickly in a matter of weeks or months, many, many times. Failure is the friend of the entrepreneur, not the enemy. This is a different way of thinking about it. It's very, very important. So what we want to do is fail fast and often at the beginning in order to get to the winning model. So that it looks like this. We have a formation stage where we have this idea, then we go through a validation stage, and not till we validate it do we go through the growth stage. Trying to force the growth stage without the validated model is folly and leads to lots of losses of time and money. At Startup Ignition, we teach about these six phases. And what we do is we teach people to focus very heavily here because most entrepreneurs want to jump over all these steps and get into the growth and scaling phase without validation and discovery. Not smart. So it's not bad to do the right things. It's just bad to do the right things in the wrong order. We don't want to act like a big company before we figure out a model. It's pretty simple. Now, in a nutshell, this is what Startup Ignition is. We take you through idea. We take Gary Rhodes, who's here at BYU, he co-teaches in Startup Ignition, his wow factor test, which is a six hat method modified for the entrepreneurial testing, and we go through founding a company properly and then the full lean startup. It's a very rigorous process when you do it here as part of your education at BYU or participating with Steve in the Center for Entrepreneurship. This is not easy. It's super easy to talk about, but I understand it's easy to say and hard to do. In closing, just want to share a whiteboard drawing I had one time that somebody said, well, is this how it is? And I go, that's exactly right. So here's somebody wrote this on a whiteboard. And I said, yeah, here's Lean Startup in a nutshell. So we're going to go out and ex design experiments to test our assumptions. Then we're going to get out of the building and go talk to customers. Yeah. And then we're going to analyze and conclude things and decide whether we accept, revise, or reject what we're looking at. Yeah. So this is a student that repeated it back to me. I go, this is pretty good. I like that whiteboard. That's a good drawing. So plain and simple, this process works. In closing, I'll quote Voltaire. He said this, God is on the side of, not on the side of the big arsenals, but on the side of those who shoot best. Now that's a funny way of looking at it. Time and time again in my career, I've seen major corporations or well-funded ventures fail because they went ahead of themselves before they had a business model. If you use the Lean Startup to shoot with a very specific rifle at what you're working on, you can have success and you can find your way. I don't have time to tell you about it today, but most of the great companies today were started by college students. Microsoft, Google, you name it. 
the ones that have changed our lives were people at college age. There's something magical and special about being college age. This is the time to do it. You're at the number two ranked university in the world for entrepreneurship. If you've got an idea, if you want to pursue something, if it's in the tech field, more power to you. Get with the Center for Entrepreneurship, get with the program here and make it happen. Thanks for your time.